This was a terrific lunch, and I hear the morning was wonderful with some outstanding speakers. Um, I'm Brigitte Wiedemann, the chief of NCI's pediatric oncology branch, and have the honor to introduce our speakers uh, for this afternoon. Um, can the poster presenters slowly move back to take a seat? Because we will be in introducing our, our next speaker momentarily. I would like to take a moment to thank the Children's Cancer Foundation for really a terrific meeting and for all the support uh, to bring together clinicians, researchers, and students um, from our different um, cities um, so we can connect. It, it is, for me, definitely a highlight um, of the year. I look forward already to, to next year's. Uh, Christine and everybody, well, starting back, sorry. <laughs> um, we had a, a, in the morning a talk from Dr. Akshantala about sarcomas, and we'll start the afternoon session again with more of an overview. Um, and um, our speaker is Dr. Blashi Davila. Um, he's an attending physician at the Division of Blood and Barrel Transplantation at Children's National, an expert in leukemia and bone marrow transplantation. And he will provide an overview for us on leukemias, clinical overview, and novel treatment approaches. Um, Thank you so much. I, I'm looking for Dr. Davila, but I think he'll be here. There he is. Um, please join me in welcoming Dr. Davila. Hello, everybody. Um, thanks for the kind introduction, Brigitte. Um, again, my name is Blachi Davila. I'm one of the bone marrow transplant docs at Children's National and uh, been tasked with talking to you about a brief clinical overview as well as novel treatment approaches in leukemias in all of 15 minutes, daunting task. So we'll go pretty quickly through this, but um, for the learners in the audience, leukemia is a general term that encompasses cancers of blood cells. It is by far the most common cancer uh, in childhood and it is typically characterized by very rapid cell growth of the blood cells that takes over the function of the bone marrow. The bone marrow typically makes all of your blood cells, so your hemoglobin, your platelets, and your white cells, and so because the marrow is overtaken by the leukemia, the main things that we see are signs of your marrow not functioning well, so anemia, thrombocytopenia, and then poor white cell function. And uh, we typically treat this with chemotherapy, all sorts of different chemotherapies which have been changing through the years, which is what I hope to show you today. Um, this is data from the Surveillance and Epidemiology Program of the National Cancer Institute um, on pediatric leukemia. And what I want to show you is if you see on the, on the top diagram there, you can see the top line is the incidence of pediatric leukemia, which has been pretty stable from the 70s to now, but the bottom line is the death rate, and you can see that the death rate has been declining uh, pretty consistently, and uh, compare that to the line below, which is actually the survival, the five-year survival of patients diagnosed with pediatric leukemia, and you'll see that we have done a pretty good job at increasing that through the years from a survival that was in the 40s in the 70s to an overall survival of about 90% in the current era. Um, and uh, there's been a lot of changes in treatments from there till now, and uh, most of those have actually been within the last couple decades. Um, and I hope to show you three very big important things that have made this survival happen. Um, so the first thing is specific targeting. Our first chemotherapies and our first treatments were very broad and very different ways of trying to kill different cells. But as we learn more and more about cancer and about the body, we can target our treatments to, uh, to something that is more specific for the cancer and less harmful for the patient. Um, this is, I think, a very good example. Um, so what I'm showing you here is a normal chromosome 9 and normal chromosome 22 in patients, but there is a defect in genes in patients with this particular type of leukemia where chromosomes 9 and 22 break and then fuse together in different ways. 
And so you can see this change chromosome 9 and uh, the change chromosome 2, which we call the Philadelphia chromosome. Um, now, I should note that this Philadelphia chromosome is present in many different types of leukemia, so this is not specific to just one type of leukemia, but essentially every patient that has this particular leukemia called CML has this uh, Philadelphia chromosome. And what this chromosome does is it creates a protein, which I'm showing you on the right side of the diagram, um, that's a tyrosine kinase that essentially keeps the cell active at all times. And so because the cell is active at all times, it has a big survival advantage, big growth advantage, and this predisposes patients to development of leukemia in these cells. Um, it is and this is important for me to show you because um, we did not know this before the advent of genomics, right, and studying chromosomes and seeing what's happening. And now that we know that this is the defect that causes this issue, we can actually create something that specifically binds this. So that chromosome, that protein that is created by that chromosome change, the BCR able, can be um, binded by this medication called imatinib. And so in this little diagram, you see that imatinib essentially puts itself in the area that would require energy for that BCA variable to activate. So because you're blocking that, the protein actually cannot activate in cell, and that stops that survival advantage of the cells and kills that cells. So this was one of the first directly targeted treatments that we did for leukemia. And actually, for the vast majority of these patients, taking this pill, this once-a-day pill, is enough to keep the, treat the cancer at bay, which is entirely different and very revolutionizing compared to the way we did cancer treatment before. Similarly, um, we have found ways to understand the immune system better and sort of are now able to harness that energy of the immune system to our advantage. Um, I see from the posters that there's a lot of you that work with CAR-Ts. Um, so again, for the learners of the audience who may not know that, CAR stands for chimeric antigen construction, uh, sorry, chimeric antigen receptor. Um, it is a type of T-cell therapy, and essentially what we're doing, which I show you on the diagram here, is we take patients' own cells and we're looking for their T-cells. The T-cells are sort of the main driver of the immune system. We take those T-cells to the lab and we construct a T cell and essentially train it to attack whatever we want it to attack. And that's where chimeric antigen receptor comes to name, because we're literally creating that receptor. In this particular example, we're creating a CAR T for BALL, which is a, a specific type of leukemia and the most common type of leukemia we see in the pediatric age range. Um, and so all B cells have this protein called CD19. And so we're essentially creating a T cell that will recognize CD19 and attack it. So we grow millions of these cells in the lab, and then we give them back to the patient. Um, and those T cells are going to bind to the cancer because they're going to bind to everything that has CD19 and will destroy the cell. So this is a treatment for chemotherapy-resistant B cell ALL. And, uh, is yet again another way of harnessing the immune system to an advantage, but most importantly, it creates a product that directly targets the cancer, but does not target anything else in the body, um, which is, of course, the main goal for most of our therapies. Um, I should note um, that CD19 is present in all B cells, like I mentioned, not just the B cells that have leukemia and there's no way of differentiating that. So an expected side effect of this treatment is that patients will no longer have B cells. B cells are important for antibody production, so these patients are going to require antibody to, uh, infusions for the rest of their lives. Um, and uh, that shows you one of the main issues we have with creating these CAR T's is we need to find a target that is present in the cells but not present in the rest of the body so that we can essentially destroy only the cancer cells.
But even with these new treatments, there are those who will not respond or those who relapse. And so what happens then, that's essentially where we come in. As I mentioned to you before, I am a stem cell transplant doc. Um, for those of you that don't know what that is, it's actually a subspecialty between the hematology oncology world. Um, <clears throat> so we essentially replace the body's bone marrow to try to overtake whatever defect is happening in the bone marrow. Um, so what we'll do is we'll try to find a donor, a good donor, whose cells are very alike the patient, and we are going to condition the patient to essentially remove all of their uh, marrow, and then we're going to replace that with somebody else's cells, so with the donor cells. Um, and these donor cells are going to have normal function, right? So they're going to have whatever function the patient was lacking. Uh, and uh, that way we can sort of revamp a new immune system and a new marrow for all of these patients. Um, it has a lot of steps, um, but just in a general, very simplified version, uh, that's how it looked like. We would find a donor, prep the patient, infuse the cells, and then follow the patients to recovery to make sure that the new cells in them are getting along okay. Um, as you may imagine, that is quite an intense process. Um, and uh, it typically involves very intense chemotherapy, which wouldn't be quite toxic. Um, so we in the bone marrow transplant field have also been targeting treatments that, uh, similarly to what I've shown you before, can directly attack the cells, but minimize toxicities for the patients in other ways. Um, and so with that in mind, I'd like to share with you a couple things that we have currently open um, at Children's National that I am a part of. Um, so the first thing is trying to find preparate regimens or conditioning regimens that will empty out the patient's marrow so that we can give the new cells, but doing that in a less toxic way. Um, this is a new compound uh, called Briculimab that we have been using in testing and in trials. Um, so it's actually an anti-CKIT antibody. CKIT is uh, yet another protein, um, but what this protein does is the, it makes your stem cells, so the baby cells in your marrow that are capable of creating all of your cells, um, they need specific proteins called stem cell factor to survive and to grow and to proliferate. And so similar to what I was showing you with the imatinib before, what this does is it prevents stem cell factor from binding to the stem cells, and that kills off the patient's stem cells because you require that interaction for survival. So this is a way of emptying out the patient's marrow without having to use chemotherapy. Um, we are an open site for a multi-institutional trial that is using this in a condition called severe combined immunodeficiency. So not leukemia, but some, something else we treat with bone marrow transplant, um, where it has proven its efficacy to do this. And so now there are trials opening that, is go that are going to study this in patients with AML, which is a type of leukemia, and then patients with myelodysplastic syndrome. Um, and the hope is that incorporating this into your preparative regimen is going to let you drastically reduce the amount of prep, prep, uh, sorry, preparation and chemotherapy that you have to give the patient in order for the transplant to take. And then um, last but not least, also at Children's, we've been working on ways to try to consolidate um, treatments post-transplant to try to prevent relapse from happening. So I'm showing you to the right just a small part of the big team that does this research in the lab. And so what this team is doing is developing multi-antigen specific T cells. Um, this is somewhat similar to what I showed you with the CAR T, um, except what we do here is we actually in the lab teach the T cells to attack proteins that are going to be very expressed in tumor cells or cancer cells and that are not as heavily expressed in normal cells. Um, we have that available actually for many different types of cancer, including leukemias and also solid tumors. Um, and uh, 
we create these in the lab and infuse them in patients post-transplant. And the goal is, you know, um, when patients are initially post-transplant, that is a very new marrow, a very new immune system that is very low in terms of its capacity to fight cells. So this is an extra bolus of cells, of immune cells that were targeted that cancer and can therefore help decrease the risk of relapse until the patient's immune system comes fully back up. Um, and uh, so there's a lot of pivotal trials happening here at the moment, which hopefully will continue to help decrease the risk of relapse for our patients. So that was quite the whirlwind of things, um, but I hope I showed you that um, survival for pediatric leukemia is actually very good. We've done great from the 70s to now, um, but it's still not perfect, and we always aim to be better, and we hope to be able to treat and cure everybody that comes to uh, our doors. Uh, more importantly, we want to do that in a way that is efficacious but also safe for the patient. So uh, new technology and a lot of the research that you guys are doing um, is going to, has allowed and will hopefully continue to allow for the creation of treatments that are going to be specific to the disease and are going to continue to minimize the toxicity that patients can face with the chemo. Uh, which is our ultimate goal, right? We all want to create medications that will get rid of the cancer, but not target anything else. Um, so thank you for your attention, and with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. I, I don't know that this works. Are there any questions for Dr. Davila? Maybe I ask a question because I really this is not my my strong suit. When and how do you decide to go forward with the transplant? You know what? Can you maybe talk a little bit about the indications? Um, you know, in patients where there may be other treatments that are effective um, in leukemias. Yeah, absolutely. It's a good question. So the the great thing is, like I've shown you. Um, Survival in leukemia is great, and so that means that the vast majority of patients are going to respond to the treatments that we currently have available. And uh, new treatments like CAR-T continue to pop up all the time and um, are much less toxic than what transplant can do at the moment, right? So um, if initial therapy is enough, then those are not patients that we consider for transplant. Typically, um, when we have patients that have not responded well to treatment or patients that have relapsed in their leukemia despite receiving all of these treatments, those are the patients that we would consider for transplant. Um, the vast, vast majority, uh, you know, speaking specifically to leukemia, the vast, vast majority of patients are going to respond and so are not never patients that we are going to meet. But um, because leukemia is so, you know, it's by far the most common pediatric cancer, so even though it's a very, very small amount of people that relapse, uh, that small amount of people that relapse is still enough to be one of the biggest groups that tend to come to transplant, just again because of the frequency of the leukemia. Um, but yes, in short, um, very high risk people or people that have relapsed multiple times would be the ones that we would see. Are there any other questions? Otherwise, I have another question. Um, <laughs> what, what is the um, field of moving like CAR T cell therapies more in the upfront setting? Currently, this is for refractory disease, right? At this point in time, I was just curious if you could comment on that. Yeah, that is a great question. So, uh, so you're right. The f this medication was first used in people that are multiply resistant. So. In order to qualify for it, you have to have relapsed at least twice before you would even be considered. Um, but you're right, we have found out that um, not only is it quite efficacious, it also targets the leukemia directly. Um, it does have some side effects, which are important to manage, but they are manageable side effects. So um, with that in mind, the field is actually trying to move towards using it a little bit more upfront. Um, so, there's a big, um, the COG, the Children's Oncology Group, is a very big 
uh, group of multi-institutions across the United States that all treat patients together. And so they actually have an open trial of trying to bring that up front for patients that are high risk. Um, the reason being, like I told you before, the vast, vast majority of patients are going to respond to just standard treatment. Um, and so with over 90% uh, survival and relapse free survival, um, we tend to have very good outcomes. It's mostly the high risk patients that are higher risk of relapsing and needing more therapy. So those are the ones that the trial is starting with. Um, and then I think as we see how that grows, probably slowly but surely that will continue to expand. Dr. Toretsky is going to introduce our B-cell ALL fighter. Thank you for your talk. Welcome. Thank you.